It's on. Good morning. Now that I'm here, I had to go get what I'm not supposed to eat. I'm having a blood test on Monday, and I got an apple fritter. Uh-oh. My goodness, does that look good. Okay, we are on uh, Revelation chapter 10. We're going to be uh, looking at uh, 12, uh, the urgency, just to, just to uh, recap a little bit. And um, Sharon brought up a, a, a deal that was very interesting last week. Oh, you know something? Um, would you do me a favor, Steve? Would you put that microphone back where it belongs? In front of Sharon. Just give it to Sharon. Okay. That way, if she asks a question, we'll at least have it on the thing. Last week, she asked about Antichrist with the comment, Antichrist, about the comment that nowhere in Revelation does it talk about the Antichrist, well, with that specific title. Now, that's true. Uh, John does not talk about the, John does talk about the Antichrist, but he doesn't use the title Antichrist. Uh, turn to 1 John um, 2.18. Well, I eat some of this. 1 John 2.18. And as soon as you get it, Sharon, would you read it, please? And use the microphone. Please. Uh-huh. Dear children, this is the last hour. And as you have heard that the Antichrist is coming, even now many Antichrists have come. This is how we know it is the last hour. Okay, so John, who wrote Revelation, does speak about the Antichrist, but not in Revelation. Um, look at um, verse 22 as well, please, in 1 John. Yeah. Verse 22. Who is the Antichrist? Okay. So, John talks about Antichrist. And in verse 22, he's very specific. He is the liar. He says that Jesus is not the Messiah. And the word anti means the opposite of, okay? So, what? Against or opposite of, okay? Um, and so, Christ demonstrates love. The devil demonstrates what? Hate. Uh, Christ teaches us to love our neighbor as ourselves, that we're to turn the other cheek. The Antichrist, the devil, teaches revenge. You don't love your neighbor, you get even with them. Okay, so anyone who is of the devil is Antichrist. Uh, a, good, a good example of that would be Ben Shapiro. Uh, he is with the Daily Wire, and he is anti-Christ, very much so. And, and so, anything that is against Christ is anti-Christ. Well, the book of Revelation talks about that which is against Christ, and against the gospel, and against the church. That's anti-Christ whether it be the devil or um, one of his minions. Anyone who is not of Christ is of the devil. It's that simple. Uh, there's only two. There's God and there's the, the devil. And so um, Jesus specifically says in the gospel, um, when he's speaking to the leaders of the Jewish nation and the church, 
your father is the devil. So they were anti-Christ. And Christ talks about it, and John does too. And he says there are what amount of antichrists in the world? Many. There are many that are antichrist. The Jews are antichrist. The Muslims are antichrist. The Buddhists are antichrist. Shinto is antichrist. Hindu is antichrist. And, and so... All of the false religions of the world are anti-Christ. And this is what Revelation is dealing with. The persecution of the church by the anti-Christ forces in the world. Right? Now because of that, there is an urgency. There's no more time to vacillate, the Lord is at hand, time is running out. When the angel had taken his solemn oath, when he had held the little book in his hand, left hand and raised his right hand to God and took his oath um, and spoke his message, time was running out. When the world ends, time ends. There is no time the way we think of it in heaven. Um, to be absent from the body is to be with Christ. To be with Christ is to be at the beginning and the end of all things. And so there's no delay. It's going to happen, and it's going to happen now. At that point in Revelation. The only problem is we're not what? you got to answer because I'm trying to eat. Mm -hmm. We don't know the time. No, it's going to be 5 o'clock somewhere. But we don't know when. Oh, okay. Use that, please. <laughs> the end of time is one heartbeat after my heart stops beating. Yes, you're right. For you it is. Tell me when that's going to be. No, tell me the exact time and date. Okay? Yeah, that's right, Walt. It's up to God. Okay? So, yes, for you, that's when it ends, but not for me. Because um, I probably will still be alive then. Probably. Now, this part of Revelation uh, has a built-in warning that time is slowly but surely running out. The universe that we live in is largely unknown and unexplored by man. It still exists with regards to time, in an infinite framework within the infinite reaches of eternity. But when Christ comes again, it ceases to exist. And time <clears throat> does along with it. Because we will be with Christ. And like I said, he is the beginning and the end of all time. Now, time is running its course and will end together with the entire universe in its present form at a point already determined by God. Acts 17.31 brings this out. But God has no end. And the fact that we will be with God means that we have no end either. And the fact that the end has not yet come doesn't mean that God is haphazard or um, undetermined. He will accomplish his will in his time. And still less does it mean that uh, the end will never come or that there is no God. The angel's oath of confirmation is 
for every child of God an end of all strife, all temptation, all texts and tribulations. And that's the wonderful thing about it. Peter tells us that the end itself will come at the sound of the seventh final trumpet. And only Christ knows that. Okay, now, we're moving into uh, verse 8. Um, Walt, you have the, it in front of you. Would you read uh, verse 8 to the end of the chapter, please? Revelation 10, verses 8 through the end of the chapter. Then the voice that I had heard from heaven spoke to me once more. Go, take the scroll that lies open in the hand of the angel who is standing on the sea and on the land. So I went to the angel and asked him to give me the little scroll. He said to me, take it and eat it. It will turn your stomach sour, but in your mouth it would be as sweet as honey. I took the little scroll from the angel's hand and ate it. It tasted as sweet as honey in my mouth. But when I had eaten it, my stomach turned sour. Then I was told, you must prophesy again about many peoples, nations, languages, and kings. All right. Oh, no. All right. What does God command John to do? Yeah. He commands him to take this. If you look in the left hand of that angel, and the angel's backwards, by the way, It got flipped. He has his right hand raised to God, it says, and in his left is a little book. He's clothed with power. He expounds the gospel because of the rainbow and the, the clouds that he's clothed with depict the power of God. So what does God command? He is commanded to take the book and digest it. The book is open. Therefore, at this point, it is visible to all. It is there for all. It's unfortunate that all don't take it to heart. Now, I imagine that John at this point is in true awe of God. Now, how does John react to God's instructions? What does he do? Yeah. He confronts the angel. Give me the book. And so he follows God's instructions. The church exists to follow the instructions of the Lord. And the Lord gives the church its instructions, its marching orders. Uh, what are they? What are the marching orders of the church? Well, I take another bite. Okay, go make disciples of all nations. How do you do that? Okay, you baptize and you teach. And what are you to teach? What are we to teach? The gospel. The gospel. Did you look at my notes? Okay. You might have. Oh, you are. You are. So um, don't worry about it. So he is to take the book, and what is he to do with it? Okay, he is to eat it. It's not a physical eating. 
He is to make that which is in the gospel his entire life. He is to live by the teachings of the gospel. Anyone who teaches contrary to the gospel is anti-Christ. So what does the gospel teach us? It teaches us that Jesus came in the flesh and died for us. He became our substitution for sin. And that is how we are to live our lives. While we were yet sinners, Christ demonstrated his love for us in that he gave us, what? His life. He died for us. But not just for us, but he died for all people. And we are to make followers of Christ by baptizing them and teaching them the truth of the word of God. And that's, that's a difficult sometimes for Christians to do because too many Christians don't study God's Word. They're stagnant in their faith. We're going to talk about that during the sermon today. And because of that stagnant existence, they don't grow in their relationship with God and they don't grow in faith. And that's an unfortunate thing. So he is to make the gospel part of his life. Now, was there a consequence to this action? Nobody wants to answer the question. Look at my mouth full of food, you know. Answer the question. Okay. Okay. It will be like honey in your mouth. It'll be like this wonderful pastry that I'm not supposed to eat. It is so sugary. Save me, Dottie, save me. Uh, yeah, Jesus already did. Would you take this so that I don't eat any more of it? Okay, so that tastes really what? It tastes absolutely heavenly. That's what the gospel is. When we receive the gospel... It is like honey in our mouths. It's special. And I'm sitting here looking at the rest of that apple fritter, and I'm saying, gee, that is so good, I want more of it. But there's a problem. There's a problem. What did John find in verse 10 as a result of receiving God's grace? Then I took the little book out of the angel's hand and ate it. And it was sweet as honey in my mouth. But when I had eaten it, my stomach became bitter. Tomorrow I have a blood test. It has to do with my diabetes. So what do I automatically know is going to happen when they draw blood tomorrow? Yeah, my sugar is going to be high. Okay. Yeah, I know. But I'll have something more later. <laughs> okay. And, and so it tastes good but it's going to affect me. Okay. That's the gospel. It's the message of God's mercy and grace to us. It's the message that our sins are forgiven and that, 
they're forgiven because of Jesus Christ. And that tastes so wonderful. But, and here's the but, it's going to turn sour in your stomach. What is offered, forgiveness of all sins, was as honey to the taste. But it's going to turn your stomach. Because of God's grace, you're going to be persecuted by the world and even by other people that claim to be Christians. And that persecution is hard to digest. It's not something that Christians are ready for. It's just not. And when we are persecuted by the Antichrist, by the haters, then that persecution is likely like a, um, a food poisoning. It's hard to, to take at times. But it is going to happen. It is going to happen. Uh, my oldest daughter um, was talking with a, a friend at lunch off of um, H2 Hill is a medical company off their property. And someone didn't like what she was saying and reported it to the manager. Because she was talking with the woman about her sobriety. The woman was having trouble with alcohol. And she was pointing the woman to Christ. And the boss at H2 Hill told her to never do that again. Wasn't even on property. And they were out at lunch again. And her responsibility to that woman was to point her in the right direction. At that point, she was at a place called the Little Country Church in uh, Red Bluff and Reading area. And the Little Country Church had about 2,000 worshipers. They weren't a little church. Uh, she had a drug and alcohol program that she administered at the church, and she had about 140 teenagers in the program. And so she knew exactly where to point this woman. Well, another, the same person overheard them again, went to the boss. And you know what H.T. Hill did? Fired her, yeah. They fired her. And she wasn't even on property. Um, but they considered that against company policy. You're there from 8 to 4 whether you're on property or not on property. And so, for her, being able to tell this woman about the programs that were available to her was honey in her mouth. It was her ministry. But it turned sour because of the persecution it brought to her, and she was fired from her job. And, you know, you wouldn't think that would happen in America, but it does all the time. Um, you would be surprised how hateful groups in this country can be. Um, yeah, over, yeah, over things that are none of their business. Um, there was a, a while back, I don't know if it's still that way, but there was a while back where Disney employees were told they were not to come to the office with crosses on, cross jewelry, couldn't wear it. 
um, and you would be punished if you did. And so the Christians weren't allowed to wear crosses anymore. Um, that's persecution. And there are other companies that are the, the exact same way. Yeah, um, the most intolerant people are those that scream the most for tolerance. What they mean by tolerance is you do it our way, but we're not going to listen to your side of the question because it's not what we want to hear. They're very intolerant, okay? And, and so this is what this is talking about. You are going to hear the gospel, and it's going to be precious to you. But it will bring persecution. Who cares? Um, whose responsibility is it to proclaim the gospel? Yeah, well, not everyone's, because everyone would include the who's, those that have to hear the gospel, okay? It is the responsibility of the Christian to proclaim the gospel to who? And there is a, there, it, it's, um, you take a rock and just toss it up and have it drop on the pond, and it creates what? And where do the ripples go? They keep going outward, and they, and they get more ripples. It's really strange. You throw one rock in, you think you get one ripple, but you get a bunch of ripples, okay? And the ripple circle gets ever what? Wider. Yeah. Well, that's not true either, uh, what I said in the first place. You throw one in, don't you get one ripple out? And it keeps getting bigger. Um, and so we present the gospel, and the people we present it to is like a ripple. It, it gets bigger and bigger and expands, okay? Where's the first responsibility? Your family. This church is not my first responsibility. It's not even my second. It's, it's actually the what, do you know? God, family, myself, my extended family. Then comes the what? Then comes the church. Okay? So I have a ministry outside of this congregation. Okay, so um, Robert's ministry is where? It's the same. To God first, to his family, his immediate family, his extended family, and then the church, and himself. So he's, a, so he's at the same, the same place that I am at, okay? So then take yourselves, God, family, yourself, your extended family, and then everybody else, okay? Starting where? Where you live. And then that circle expands. Okay, so you are part of a church, Grace Lutheran Church, and you uh, have a ministry here. You have a prayer ministry. What should every member of this church be doing with their church directory? You should be praying through it. Take three families a day and pray for those families, or one family a day, and specifically pray for that family. Okay? It's going to take you three months to get through it. But if everyone is doing that, there's a lot of prayer going up for that family. Okay? So we have... Yeah. 
Yeah, but what about the rest of the days during the year? Every, epi, every six, six months or so, I pick up my church directory and I do what with it? I call people. Yes, I've called your house. I've called your house so many times, I know the number by heart. Actually, you're on my speed dial. <laughs> yeah, you are. Tom is. Larry is. Joan is. Okay, so I probably talk to almost everybody in this congregation uh, every other month. Okay, how many of our members call through their phone directory and and say, "Hey, it was nice to see you in church Sunday. How's it going?" Okay, that's what we should be doing, but that's not what most Christians want. It's not what they do. That's a Texas thing. Yes, it is. You want to know how I know it is? In my first congregation, they would say, Pastor, you move from preaching to being nosy, to meddling. You move from preaching to meddling, okay? And, and that's a Texas thing, you know? Um, hey, call them up. Call them up. How many of you have called um, Brian? I have, Roger has, Joan has. Brian didn't have a heart attack. They don't know what in the world it was. Yeah, first it was supposed to be a clogged artery. Uh, first it was supposed to be pneumonia. Then it was supposed to be a heart attack with a clogged artery. Then it turned out, what did he say? There was no clogged artery? Nothing, nothing at all. <laughs> they don't know what happened. But now he has got vertigo. Yeah. Again, I told him to stay in bed. Oh, no, that was after that. Yeah. 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 yeah, see, it's a good thing you called. Because when I talked to him, he was in bed. He, he, the vertigo was so, a headache and bed. And there is a type of, and he's been getting these headaches. And, the, and that's when he falls down. Dot stays near a wall or has a cane. Um, Brian just goes outside. Wham. Yeah, and he couldn't get back to it. Yeah. That was, after, that was before I talked to him, okay? So, without Robert calling and checking or with him finally getting to a phone, there was no way to get him help. The people that are on that recovery list should be contacted by half a dozen people just to make... The, the, their elder should call on them. The pastor does. Yeah, yeah. that's what I told him. He needs to get something that alerts Linda that he's fallen down. Or get that silly thing, I fell down and I can't get up, you know? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, but he left it in the house. <laughs> yeah. You didn't have it with you. I told him you have to put it in your pocket. Um, and, and so these are part of the things that as gospel-centered people and our place within the kingdom of God, we should be doing. We should be doing that. Um, when was the last time you brought somebody food? A, a, a dish. Cooked them a dish. Okay? Um, Really, that's a nice thing to do, you know. And, and and Linda's got having problems. She yes, she's walking around, but she's still hurting. And, and Cooper, he's in physical therapy. He can't get around good. Um, you know, the people that the 
that live out there, bring them a casserole. You know, um, that way Linda doesn't have to walk around and cook. Yeah, they do, but... Uh, yeah. I can't walk. I told him all he needs to do is walk outside and jump in the pool, and he will lose half of his weight. You'll float. And, you know, if you just get your back on a, a thing and just float, it feels so good. So, yeah, and do exercises in the pool. Okay, so John's mission is uh, prominent above all things. But our mission is just as prominent. And we all have one. Unfortunately, too many Christians don't realize that they've got a ministry. And, and that's why I think sometimes our, our, our church is, is more in tune to the needs of the people than these mega churches. Um, we have a, a we have a properties board. Steve heads it up. Little Country Church had a maintenance team that was paid. We have in our churches youth group. Little Country Church, and they are, uh, I'm using them as a, um, an example of mega churches. They had a full-time paid youth pastor. They had pastors, for, they had four or five pastors for different things. We use volunteers for that. And so when you've got professional people doing it, what does the congregation do? Nothing, very little. And whose church is it? It's supposed to belong to who? To the congregation. But in these monster mega churches, they're not, the congregation just shows up. They don't have to do anything. They don't have any ownership of the church because who owns it? Yeah, who, owned, who owns Joel Osteen's church? Joel. And the board that he has what? Appointed. And most of them are family members. The congregation doesn't own that church. They have no say, basically. Okay, so we have ministries. And our ministry is a, a big one. And we need to take those ministries to heart just as John did. We need to make the gospel a part of our life, a big part. We need to realize that as we reach out with gospel ministry to those around us, we're going to face persecution. I've had, I've had a, a, a relative actually hang up on me because they didn't want to hear the gospel. That's persecution. And I know people have been fired. I know people that their family won't even talk to them because of their Christian faith. Um, I'm sorry? Oh, yeah. Yeah, they, uh, yeah. Uh, Scientology is another one. It's a cult. And they will, they will persecute you if you leave the cult. Um, but, other, but other things, too. You ever heard of love bombing? Love bombing. It's a tactic used by the youth in the Mormon church to get people to move away from Christianity and become Mormon. To love bomb is to... Um, to become the, the most loving friend that person has to the point that they, they want to be with you all the time. And so they'll want to be with you at church too. And so they love bomb them. 
But when the kids um, realize what's happening and they uh, are going to go back to their regular church, those kids get on their case. And they're ostracized and, and, and they're persecuted to the point where they are afraid to leave. That's how cults work. That's how cults work. And so we've got to understand that as we draw closer to Christ, the more persecution we're going to face. Okay? Uh, I'm going to end there this week. I really don't want to get into chapter 11 uh, Steve, will you turn us off, please? Steve's going to go turn off the camera. Steve's yes. going to turn off the camera. And um, let's close with prayer. God of grace, we thank you for our time together in chapter 10. Bless us and keep us in your grace, Lord. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.